Are you ready to take it away? Yes, I am. So hello, hello, everyone. My name is Elliot Ellenby. I am a technical intelligence analyst, psychology writer, and a graduate student in cyber psychology. Today, I will be talking about seeing the actual person behind threat actors and seeing the human behind the hack. So I'll be covering three things today. I'm going to make it real easy for you. First thing, I'm going to be covering forensic psychology, talking about hackers as cyber criminals, the why behind they do that. Think criminal minds, think mind hunters. Next up, I'll be talking about hacker culture, whether malicious or not, there is a culture amongst the hacker community and we'll be talking about how that impacts their motives. And the last one we'll be talking about is the combination of the two of those in a field called cyber psychology. Now, before we get into it, one of the big questions a lot of people have is why? Now, that's a valid question, especially for a lot of things in the humanities. Cyber psychology is a growing field because technology is also growing as well. Technology impacts us sociologically and psychologically in ways that we don't understand yet. And understanding cyber criminals and threat actors on this psychological level gives blue teams and incident response a new angle to work with. When you're dealing with high profile crimes where let's say the FBI in the United States comes in, they might develop psychological profiles to help get personal identifiable information. We don't really have a similar system for cyber criminals yet. So it's a good thing to look into. First things first, the forensic psychology. Now, a big aspect in forensic psychology and psychology as a whole is a concept called the big five. What the big five is, is pretty much five personality traits that are easily measurable and when all put together, gives you a good idea of the psyche of a person. There's openness to experience, which is pretty self-explanatory. It's how willing you are to try new things and how creative you are. This comes with high levels of intellect and creativity, as I said. The intellect's weird because it's not really like how well you score on a test. That's not intellect. It's your intellectual style. So how you are able to perceive and remember information. How does this tie into cyber criminals and hackers? Well, an independent psychological study for the Journal of Business Ethics here in the United States uh, interviewed and tested multiple self-identified white hat, gray hat, and black hat hackers and saw where they scored on the big five. For openness to experience, white and gray hats were pretty neutral, like nothing too crazy. Black hat hackers, on the other hand, scored very high, meaning that they were very open to experience, almost impulsive. The impulsivity is comorbid with some fragmented thinking and potentially some paranoia, like security paranoia, but that is also person to person. Next on the big five is conscientiousness. And while it is a mouthful, it pretty much just means how responsible and organized you are. You adhere to societal norms and rules, and you're also very goal oriented and hardworking. White, gray, and black hats, neutral across the board. Uh, hats of all kinds had strong perseverance, a level of self-efficacy. However, there was that lack of desire for total conformity, whether it's conforming to society via appearances or conforming to a typical office job. Agreeableness. This is pretty much how trusting you are in someone, being altruistic and selfless, and also just being generally moral. White hat hackers scored very high, very high with their self uh, identification of being altruistic. There's also a high focus on inhibition and control from impulsivities. Uh, trends of high and low agreeableness amongst black and gray hat hackers seemed more correlational than causational. However, there is a level of lack of self-control from inhibitions from black hat hackers especially. Extroversion is probably one you've heard of. You might have heard the extrovert versus introvert thing. Extrovert is just being, getting energy from social interactions. You are sociable and outgoing, generally likable. If there's a party, people might flock to you. This also comes with high levels of creative thinking, and not only with extroverts, but with ambiverts as well, the combination of extrovert and introverts. This combination, the ambivert, 
That was the majority amongst white, gray, and black hat hackers. They are able to thrive in alone time, but also thrive in social situations, which makes sense. There is the social aspect of working on teams or social engineering. And there's the private aspect of sitting alone at your computer for hours at an end, hacking away at something. Last of the big five is neuroticism. Neuroticism is weird and not, might not be what you think. This can be anything from anger and anxiety, irritability, self-consciousness, emotional instability, depression. This can mean a lot of things, basically nothing too jazzy. Gray hats, interestingly, scored higher in neuroticism with more anxiety and paranoia than their white and black hat peers. Now that we've covered the big five, how does this tie into forensic psychology? Well, in forensic psychology, we have our own set of personality traits. Now I'm going to preface this that none of these traits guarantee that someone will be a hardened criminal. And having some or all of these traits scored really high doesn't mean you're a criminal nor a bad person. The theory behind the dark tetrad is that if someone scores high in psychopathy, Machiavellianism, narcissism, and or sadism, they are more likely to commit deviant or criminal behavior. What is interesting in this regard is that hedonism, power, and manipulation, those are traits that are often comorbid with the dark tetrad, meaning that if you have the dark tetrad traits, you likely might be hedonistic and crave power. These comorbidities also increase the likelihood of cyber stalking according to independent American psychological studies. This is also especially prominent in women, surprisingly. Women with heightened narcissism specifically were significantly more likely to cyber stalk their intimate partners. With cybercrime as a whole, uh, hackers with the technical know-how and also higher than average levels of psychopathy specifically were more likely to engage in unethical hacking. So there's a couple existing theories with cyber psychology and forensic psychology. The first one is routine activity theory or RAT because that is a much more fun name. RAT pretty much means you need three things for crime to happen. You need an accessible target. When you're online, everyone's a target. That makes it easier. Number two, you need an absence of a guardian capable of intervention. Online, even easier. You don't go to a website and see a security guard patrolling around. There's no security cameras on most websites. So there's this lack of authority or guardians online. Third thing you need is a motivated defender. Online, the other two are pretty much guaranteed. So if you wanna hack into something, and if you wanna be a black hat hacker, there's pretty much nothing stopping you. Second theory is social learning theory. This one is not necessarily forensic psychology, but can be easily applied to it. Social learning theory pretty much means that your own behavior is adopted and modeled from your environment. Let's say you are in a hacker group, malicious or not, that group, you will be able to learn things. That behavior will be encouraged. And when you are encouraged to do a certain behavior and learn certain things, you're gonna to wanna to do it more. Your attention, retention, and reproduction of certain actions all correlates to your environment. The last theory is kind of interesting. It's a conflict theory of deviance. This pretty much states that there are social and economic factors that are at play that contribute to criminal behavior. A 1956 psychologist wrote the book, The Power Elite. Pretty much what this book says is that there is a small group of the rich and influential people at the top. Executives, politicians, military leaders, celebrities. Basically, if you think 1%, that's them. Now, these 1% people, they will design society to their rules with political pardons, lesser taxes, however. With this uh, in balance of wealth and international power, the lower classes will feel more enfranchised to commit deviant behavior. One, as retaliation, and two, as means of survival. I interviewed multiple people for this project, one of which being Jeremy Kennelly, the manager of analysis at Mandiant, specifically for the Financial Crimes Unit. He stated that the vast majority of investigated cyber incidents had a high level of financial motivation. And that tracks if you think of the cyber threatscape right now. Ransomware is the big thing. 
Ransomware is almost entirely financially motivated. Mental illness is definitely something that is heavily prominent both in criminal spheres and also cybersecurity as a whole. One big thing is burnout, while this impacts both professionals and criminals alike. This is definitely one that you've heard of before. Burnout caused from long hours of isolation and high levels of stress mean that you're less motivated, more irritable, just all around overwhelmed, not doing great. If you imagine how stressed you are as blue team, red team, or even the unethical hackers might also equally be as stressed. Security paranoia is something interesting. So security paranoia is common with IR individuals and digital forensics, but is also likely uh, prevalent throughout cyber criminals. This is pretty much your inability to shut off from that work brain of high security. So you're gonna have those heightened security protocols in your daily life. You're gonna trust less people, check the locks on your doors multiple times, be worried about people watching you through your browser. This also comes with increased stress. Now, that was a lot of psychology. Let's take a step back, step back from that, look at something a little bit fun. Let's look at hacker culture as a whole. Now, you can't look at hacker culture without looking at all the books, movies, shows, publications, everything that comes out. One of the most prominent things that helps when looking at hacker culture is Stephen Levy's 1984 book, Hackers, Heroes of the Computer Revolution. This was the cutting edge time of technology and where hackers were really starting to become a thing. So Stephen going around and interviewing these hackers, groundbreaking. He listed the tenets of hacker groups, pretty much some common themes and ethics that he saw around. Sharing, openness, decentralization, free access to computers and world improvement were some of the basic tenets. He also included things about all information should be free and that you should distrust authority and promote decentralization. The conscience of a hacker. Now in researching, I could not escape this short story. This was a short story written on the e-zine Frack, which was an internet magazine or e-zine, which is often touted as one of the best and longest running hacker zines. Freaking, anarchy, cracking, coding, all of it was covered here. The Conscious of a Hacker was written shortly after the 1986 arrest of an anonymous hacker who was named The Mentor, who we now know as Lloyd Blakenship. He was a second generation member of the hacker group Legion of Doom, if that rings a bell. And the Conscious of a Hacker has pretty much been a cornerstone for the hacker community. The short story pretty much follows this young adult who is bogged down with school and the stress of it, stating that they are much smarter than their peers and feel like they're just sort of being left alone to rot in the corner. However, this young student finds the internet, finds the hacking communities and feels at home there, but is conflicted because society, law enforcement, and his own mentors deem these hackers as criminals. Lots of the hacker community, past, present, and likely future, really found themselves in this story. They really aligned with the conflict that was happening. And this thinking and conscience of a hacker aligns with the aforementioned conflict of deviance, uh, namely the power elite, if you remember that. If these figures of power, as the story says, can lie, manipulate, and steal without repercussion, but the hackers at the bottom of the barrel are the ones deemed criminals, then they might feel enfranchised to create their own society online, which they did. Next up, this was one of my favorite rabbit holes to go down, and honestly, it's much more important than you would think, the aesthetics and culture of a hacker community. So you might look at my slides or the entire digital overdose conflicts and all the different other hacking conventions and see some similarities with the cyberpunk and vaporwave aesthetics. That actually matters, and that tells a lot about the community. Let's stop there for a quick second and take a look at what cyberpunk even is. Because even though you might like recognize some of the symbols, you might not know exactly what it entails. Cyberpunk can be tied back to a 1984 sci-fi novel called Neuromancer. Now, if you haven't read Neuromancer, I highly recommend it. 
The author previously coined the term cyberspace in a previous novel. However, the use of it in Neuromancer pretty much birthed that word. It skyrocketed in popularity, and now cyberspace is pretty much used daily. Uh, the novel follows a former hacker, now a low-level hustler, who was hired for a final job, bringing him face-to-face -face with a powerful AI, a shady government. This book has drug use, high-tech body mods, tattoos, and alternative fashion, uh, really detailed and intrinsic slang as shady governments, as I mentioned, and neon lights in a futuristic Japan. If any of that sounds familiar, You'd be right. This is pretty much the instruction booklet of the cyberpunk aesthetic. Neuromancer had it all, and the aesthetics and the anarchist political ideologies, hackers took that to heart. And they took it to heart so much that even media in the future still follow the same trends. Now, you can't talk about the aesthetics and culture of hackers without talking about the movie Hackers. This was a 1995 crime film which at the time, the hackers and the internet was still a bit of an unknown wild west. There wasn't a lot of public information or even perception about it. And hackers honestly helped with that. Despite it receiving mixed reviews and honestly kind of flopping at the box office, it became a cornerstone in hacker culture as a whole. The movie follows high school students with edgy screen names and alternative fashion, defeating a shady government with electronic music and neon lights. So while this movie created this nice, accurate caricature of hacker culture, it also influenced how hacker culture developed in the future. And its accuracy was no mistake. The screenwriter interviewed multiple cyber criminals and multiple members of the cast attended different hacker conventions. Now, St. Jude, not a piece of media. St. Jude is a person, but it's important to mention her. She was a self-taught programmer and civil rights activist in Silicon Valley, and her real name was Judith Milhan. She is quoted as saying, quote, girls need modems. Women may not be great at physical altercations, but we can sure excel at rapid fire keyboarding. She was noted, uh, she was the one that noted that there was a weird lack of female hackers at the time, and not a lot of hacker groups even had any female members. She also wrote the Cypherpunk handbook. What exactly Cypherpunk is, we will get there shortly. But why am I even talking about the aesthetics and culture as a whole? It's weird because technology and art are almost inextricably related. There are musicians, video artists, graphic artists, and poets that work with technology who will call themselves hackers and be a part of the hacker community. Computer artists like and non-artist hackers often both find themselves at the fringes of society. There is an empathetic relationship between people that design experimental music, per se, and those who code their own malware. Now, let's bounce back to cypherpunk and politics as a whole and talk about the political ideologies amongst hacker groups. Of course, a hacker, that's a large group that encompasses a lot of people. But a lot of the main themes are about anarchism and libertarianism, especially prominent with a lot of hacker groups promoting freeware and open source materials, as well as total internet decentralization. Most hacker groups have a strong urge for rights to privacy and heavily distrust authority and government. Crypto anarchism is synonymous with cypherpunk which pretty much takes the anarchist ideals, but has a bigger focus on promoting political and economic freedom through technology and personal use of cryptography, which allows for being totally anonymous and more freedom of speech. Now, there's, a, there's so many hacker groups out there, it's impossible to cover all of them. I've chosen three groups today to give a little detail on. We have Cult of the Dead Cow, Anonymous, Low Security. Cult of the Dead Cow, or CDC, contributed to the development of Tor, which is the browser that you use to access the quote-unquote deep web. Uh, Cult of the Dead Cow is one of the first and longest running hacker groups, still active to this day as a DIY mm -hmm. media group with lots of high prominent uh, members, a lot of them becoming CEOs or CISOs, one even being a strong presidential candidate in the 2020 election. Anonymous, 
is definitely one that even when you're not in tech, you've likely heard the name or seen the Guy Fox mask. They are famous for combating the Church of Scientology in 2008, utilizing DDoS attacks, prank calls, and nonviolent protests to urge the IRS to remove their tax exempt status and also educate current church members. Now, why Anonymous is interesting is that they are rather decentralized. There's no one big anonymous. It is a large group of multiple smaller groups and individuals. But what is interesting is that despite being decentralized, for the most part, motives and political ideologies line up. They follow the trends of the thought processes and ethos of hacker groups as a whole. So it's really telling about the community. Lull security sort of started as a little like branch of anonymous. Uh, they claimed multiple high profile attacks in their time, including the PlayStation one back in 2011 and a temporary outage of the CIA website. While they committed multiple politically motivated hacks later in their life, the group pretty much did everything just for fun. However, these politically motivated attacks align more with what CDC and Anonymous did, thus showing more of how the community as a whole acts and feels. All right, we are almost done here. Now we're just gonna work on how this all ties in together. With this research, there's sort of three main takeaways. Hacker communities, criminal or not, learn through community. These close communities can almost act like family. You can encourage certain behaviors. Sharing knowledge, gaining prestige amongst the group, and mentoring other members is a perfect way to not only develop new information, but also invite more members in. It is a way to build this nice friendly community where you are also able to better yourself, whether that is through learning something new or gaining prestige amongst the cyber criminal ring. With cybercrime specifically, it is uh, motivated by multiple factors. There is not one single factor that causes cybercrime or deviant behavior as a whole. One of the main things though is deviance without repercussions. As I said earlier, there's no authority figure online. There's no police security guard. And because of that, oftentimes there's no clear negative consequences. Yes, cyber criminals have been arrested before, but think of the ones that have been arrested versus the slew of them that haven't. Because of this, hacks might seem to only have positive consequences. If you're doing something and only getting the good side of it, no bad side, why would you stop? You're getting goods from this. That reinforces the behavior and encourages you to keep going. But at the end of the day, hacking and the hacking community as a whole is a large group. It is impossible to perfectly quantify it into one specific profile. Hacker is also not synonymous with cyber criminal. However, cyber psychology is a growing field. In terms of academia, it is pretty much in its infancy. I mean, hell, there is currently the first official cyber psychology textbook from 2019 or 2020. This is a new field. So there is still plenty more research to be done. But I hope you gained something from this today. I will open it up to questions. And if you are curious about my full thesis on it and want to see any of my sources for the studies, I promise the QR code is safe. It'll lead you to a Google Docs link. I'm now open for questions. Okay, hi. Uh, this, wow. Okay, <laughs> first of all, let, let me just say vaporwave nice <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> like really enjoyed the hell out of that, that slide deck thank you, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um so we've had a few questions and answers awesome. actually we haven't had the answers yet but we're gonna get them. i can give those <laughs> <laughs> is age a factor in uh getting in this no in what you've talked about yeah, age is definitely a factor. While people who are older are definitely not ruled out or an exemption, uh, younger people, given that they are sort of born or grow up with technology, are more likely to find culture and communities online. And also, especially in that pivotal development age of young teen to early adulthood, 
one of the big psychological things happening is either a desire to fit in or a desire to identify yourself. And that both of those can easily be found online if you are not getting it in person. Awesome. Wow, that's so cool. First off, I'd like to say that this is such an engaging presentation. So thank you so much for giving it. Um, I'm definitely so going to check out your thesis. Uh, you do have another question in chat awesome. um, from Swibbly Do. What role does cyber psychology play in your threat intelligence work? Threat intelligence work. So cyber psychology for right now with specifically threat intelligence works as an assistant in the way. So you still do the technical analysis of different threats and research, whatnot, but the psychological aspect comes in a lot of different ways. In terms of social engineering, that's a very obvious way. Social engineering is just psychological manipulation. There's also the thinking of, if I were to break into the system, how would I do it? Let's say I am a foreign nationalist. I would probably get into a system a different way than a financially motivated domestic cyber criminal. So that difference in criminological profiles is how cyber psychology plays a role in that. Um, small personal question. Uh, if you, are there different profiles depending on uh, people that come from a certain uh, area, let's famous for APTs, which we're not going to cite, um, and people that are from those areas, but that have gone to another country and then come back, like gotten uh, knowledge from another uh, circle, I guess. Yeah, the latter would definitely require more research and it's definitely something interesting to look into. However, there are geographic trends with cyber attacks. Ransomware is more likely to be used sourcing from certain countries and attacking other countries. There's also profiles to, to be developed based on who is being attacked. Uh, a foreign nationalist might not attack a smaller American company that they might not have heard of, but someone local definitely might. So there is information to be get from geographic regions. Awesome. And there is one final small question. Awesome. Uh, is one able to dip into cyber psychology from certification rather than like a specialization uh, after an IT degree or a psychology degree? Yeah, there is no one like cyber psychology certificate as of yet. However, having just knowledge in psychology and cybersecurity, whether that is a psychology degree and a security plus certification or a cybersecurity or computer science degree with a minor or even just personal research in psychology, that'll give you a good mix. Because cyber psychology, it means a lot of things, but at the end of the day, it is the blend of those two fields. So however you get there, that'll work. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for this uh, uh, window into hacker culture as well as, you know, the rest of the content of your talk. That was like brilliant. Uh, Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's been awesome. <laughs> yeah, honestly, uh, we're just really thankful for all the knowledge you brought. I think uh, you've engaged a lot of people. Tons of people are giving great feedback in the chat saying how much they loved your talk. So thank you for that. Yay. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>